all, all of us will try very hard to get to level four and level five. Once we are, and, and to do that, we will, we will reincarnate repeatedly on the earth. The trouble is there is amnesia when we come back. I've been able to partner with Mind Valley to present you guys free master classes between 60 and 90 minutes covering mind, body, soul, relationships, and conscious entrepreneurship. Taught by spiritual masters, yogis, spiritual thought leaders, and best selling authors. Just head over to nextlevelsoul.com forward slash free. I'd like to welcome to the show, Roberta Grimes. How you doing, Roberta? I'm, I'm doing very well. It's good to meet you. A pleasure to meet you as well, my dear. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm really excited to talk to you because you are your work that you've been doing over the years is, is very fascinating, very interesting. Not many people, you know, are in that field, or at least you know that you know it's not it's not a normal field you go into. So I'm fascinated how you got into it. <laughs> The whole, the whole process, what you've learned. But my very first question to you is, can you tell everybody the moment when you were a little girl that you knew that there was absolutely no God? Well, I was only eight. That's a hard, a hard thing to realize when you're eight years old. <laughs> you think? <laughs> yeah. It's and what, so what happened at that moment? What happened at that moment when you had that? Uh, I woke up at eight in the morning. Oh, I woke up at, in the middle of the night, but I was, eight, I was eight years old. And I had this stunning realization that there's no God. And I was really scared. Um, so then there was this bright light in my room, like burning magnesium, very bright white light. light, light. And I, I, I stared into it. It was like a flash of light. And and this voice said, you wouldn't know what it is to have me unless you knew what it is to be without me. I will never leave you again. That, that, and, and, and what did you say to that at your eight-year-old mind? I thought, oh, that's handy. If you forget there's a God, they remind you. And I went back to sleep. And how did that affect your life moving forward? Did you always just have it in the back of your head or did you even think about no, it anymore? No, it's front and center to this day. Okay. So it was something that really didn't move you and did, it did shift your, your, it, your path. I thought, I, I thought that's handy. If you forget there's a God, they remind you. And, and it, it was a very reassuring thing, but I thought it was normal. I mean, if it happens to you when you're eight years old, you assume you're still figuring the world out, right? When you're eight mm -hmm. years old, mm -hmm. So I assumed it must be normal. You always assume things are normal if they happen to you because you're still figuring the world out. And it was a long time before I understood that was definitely not a normal thing. So, so what work did you, what, can you talk to the, tell the audience what kind of work you started to get into and what got you fascinated with the afterlife and how you studied the afterlife and that whole process? Well, I, it, it, when, after I realized that that had not been normal, I began to understand that I was going to have to figure out where that voice came from, what it was. And I came to realize that there must be a place where that came from. And it probably was the same place people went after they died. There had to be an afterlife. So that was, made me, was what made me start to just sort of decide I had to figure out where the afterlife was and what it was. So how does one go about studying the afterlife? I'm assuming there's not a lot of PhDs in it. Uh, there's not a lot of <laughs> curriculum at Harvard about the afterlife, different no. levels of classes, you know, near death experiences, out of body experiences. Like there's not classes you could take for this stuff. So how did you start and how does someone go about studying the afterlife or researching the afterlife? Well, this was even back before uh, the 1970s when Dr. Raymond Moody wrote Life After Life. So mm -hmm. um, I majored in re early religion. Um, I actually, I majored in early, early Christian history in college. Uh, I figured that was where, where I would have to start. And uh, um, I learned a lot 
um, one of the things I learned is if you really enjoy hot dogs, never watch them being made. Um, <laughs> I, I never, if you if you want to be a good Christian, never under, never try to study how Christianity was developed. Um, Why is that? Because ever after, I understood that Christianity was not. <laughs> it was nothing that either Jesus or God ever developed. It was something men developed. Yeah, I mean, after I've, I, I, I would have to agree with you on that because I've studied a bit of it. I, I was raised Catholic, and 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 I went and studied a bit of it. And you, as you as you go deeper down the machine, you start to see kinks. Uh, when you, kinks, you call them a kink, kinks, little little says. kinks, little kinks. <laughs> I'm trying to be kind. I'm trying to be kind. But but generally speaking, you start, you know, you start you start looking at certain things. You're just like that. does Well, even when I was a child, even when I was in first grade, when they told me there was a hell, which terrified me, of course, because I was in first grade. Right. But then as, as years go on, you're just like, this doesn't make any sense. My father loves me. My, you know, it's a man, obviously, it can't be a woman, obviously, because, you know, that doesn't work <laughs> in, in religion. It has to be a man figure up there in a big, you know, long robe with a big white beard oh, yeah. and he and i always found us like why is he so jealous and why is he so angry and he's he very inse very insecure he would seem to be very insecure like if you don't bow to me i will rain fire and hell and you. About you. Right. I, I just didn't make any sense at that young age even in the second third fourth grade i went because i was getting pounded by it in Catholic church in a Catholic school. Didn't it make sense. So years later, you know, as I, I went to that Catholic school almost all my life. So when I graduated, I was just like, even in high school, I mean, it was just like, I don't, you mean to tell me I can go kill somebody, go get to go to confession and I'm solid. But if I ate pork on Fridays and I happen not to get to confession, I'm going to hell for the rest of my life. Like it did just, <laughs> things just longer. didn't line up. Again, kinks. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so as you so as you started to go down this road, when did you start shifting more in towards spirituality, more towards the afterlife? Like, how do you again? How do you go about studying the afterlife, especially at that time when there weren't shows like this, yeah. when there wasn't so as much information? It, it was really a, a very difficult thing until um, we, we got Life After Life, um, the, the book that uh, Dr. Moody published in 1975, because that opened the floodgates. And um, we started to get books about the evidence. Um, Near-death experiences, it may surprise your listeners to know, have nothing whatsoever to do with the afterlife, nothing. Uh, mm -hmm. People who have near-death experiences go to what we now understand is the astral plane, which has nothing to do with the afterlife. Great experiences, but though, but if, if someone is there and able to tell you the story, that person has never died. You, you, right. you, you don't come back from death. The, their, the silver cord is not severed. The silver cord, by the way, is a is a, a term that comes from the Bible, and even even the people uh, uh, thousands of years uh, before uh, the birth of Jesus knew that the silver cord is what keeps the body alive, and you can't reattach it once it's severed. So um, you you just you can't come back from death. But uh, nevertheless, once the 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 first um, once the term was coined, and we began to get people who had had near-death experiences, we also began to get good um, explorations of the, of the wonderful heyday of, of after-death communications, which happened around the turn of the 20th century. And when, once I got my hands on that literature, mm -hmm. uh, and that you could find those books in the, in the early 70s, mid-70s, you could find those books in, in uh, um, bookstores um, uh, still, uh, in, uh, in used bookstores. I became a denizen of those bookstores. And I wrote, I, I, I read, oh, hundreds and hundreds of after-death communications through through deep trance mediums. It took me two, three years to devour hundreds of these communications. 
and they were received most of them in uh, southern um, England and in the eastern United States, mostly in in southern New York State and in uh, in eastern Massachusetts. And I was a skeptic in the beginning. I couldn't believe it was possible for people to be communicating in such de extensive degrees through through these people who were in trance and talking from where the dead go. I, mm -hmm. I, I didn't believe it. I, I mean, I just, but by the end of two years, I was convinced because although they were not, none of those communications were, were the same or even all that similar. They all were from a, in the same place now. They it was the same physics, the same process, the same details, the same they, they, everything was the same. I mean, nobody said, we're, 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 was talking about having a different kind of body or different weird experiences. It was all the same. It was impossible for it not to be real. So by the end of two years, I was convinced it was real. And that's the thing that's fascinating because a lot of people who, you know, going into the near death experience stuff, a lot of people were like, oh, they've heard the story, the light and the life review. That, that, that's common knowledge. But back then, it wasn't common knowledge. And if you're reading things from the turn of the century, it definitely wasn't common. A lot of these elements that are the same. And, and, and it just, and as I interview more and more people like yourself, more and more people uh, with near death experiences and other things like that, which is not exactly what we're going to talk about today, but it just keeps ringing true again and again. And there might be some shifts here and there, especially near deaths, like it depends on the person. A lot of them are more atypical, but yeah. these were not. They were all the same. So then tell me exactly. So tell me what happens in the dying process based on your research. The, the, the dying, a natural death, and not all of us have natural deaths, but people who are, when before you enter your body to be born, you you choose two or three with your advisors. You choose two or three exit points. Usually, one is relatively early in in uh, your life, or uh, around the age of twenty or earlier. One of them is in midlife, maybe forties, and one of them is in old age. And your higher consciousness chooses. You don't choose when, when you're going to leave. But, but as you are approaching one of those exit points, if, you, if your higher consciousness decides you've gotten enough out of that life and, you, and that's the one you're going to take, about a year before that exit point, you decide, okay, you're going to exit then. And typically, if it's the, the first exit point that you choose, you will die in an accident. Many people who die Young people who die will die in an auto accident. Most of those young people who die in an auto accident, that's a normal exit point that they have chosen. It seems like it, it's an accidental death. It's not. It's, it was a chosen exit point. Um, typically in middle age, it's cancer or some kind of exit like that. Um, in old age, it's an old age, of course, a death. Um, people, in, 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 when you go to a celebration of someone's life, very often you'll see that they were wrapping up their life during that last year. They they took a trip. They they were were um, making up with uh, with relatives or friends that they hadn't seen in years. They were sharing the uh, uh, the the secret codes with their wives. I, I mean. Oddly, people are wrapping up their lives and they didn't even know they were going to die, but then they, they die. Um, my first book in this field was called The Fun of Dying. And I can't tell you how many people told me, dying is not fun. Well, it isn't fun if you're dying of a disease. Um, that's not fun. But with during the last few days before you die, usually you, you get to the point where it's pretty, you're pretty much pain free. And or, or close to it, and you're you're um, during the couple of days before death. Often, you're you start to get better. In fact, the doctor will typically say to your family, he or she is coming to the point of death, and they're actually getting better or seem to be. They're they're typically coming out of what might have been a coma they will start to, you know, want to eat or drink again. 
Um, that's a sign death is getting closer. Um, often they'll call the family and say, come and prepare to say goodbye. Um, often, often that's when people will see their deathbed visitors in the upper corners of the room, mom or a spouse or death, you know, perhaps a childhood pet will appear. They'll be young, they'll be healthy looking, happy. And that's a sign that death is very close. Everyone knows that Steve Jobs uh, at that point said, oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow. And, and other people uh, you know, said these last words and they were the last words that they said to the living people around the, the actually they didn't say them usually to the living people around the bed. They were saying them because they suddenly saw people that they thought they would never see again. And that's when they stopped communicating at all with the people that were in the room. They started communicating with their, with their dead loved ones. Then they started talking with these people in their minds. Often the people that, that, they, that who had come for them will come down into the room and, and they'll start you know, communicating um, and, and actually have, sometimes it's a party. This is the part of the, that, that we sort of miss nowadays because people are heavily sedated typically uh, nowadays before they die, which is too bad because 50, 75, 100 years ago, people weren't sedated. And often a, a room would, the, the walls of the room would disappear and they would, would have a, a detailed vision of where they were going. And they would start, they would for days be describing it to the people who were in the room, the, the living people in the room. But nowadays it's, you know, it's kind of toned down because people are sedated. But the next thing that starts to happen is that the inner body, which is leaving, starts to unvelcro. I think of it as unvelcroing. There, 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 it's the, there, there are like millions of little strings that attach us. The part that's staying, the, the material part, gets un, unstitched or unvelcroed from the part that's leaving, which is the interior part and the energy part. And that gathers in the chest and then it leaves usually through the chest wall or through the top of the head. And as it leaves, it's like a mist. In fact, you can find on the internet, people did this with mice, um, you know, mouses walking around and suddenly the trap gets it and this mist pushes out of the, out of the mouse. And that's, that's the energy part. And it's kind of creepy, but that's what <laughs> you can find it on the internet. Mm -hmm. Anything you can find on the internet. And as it leaves, it and then it appears to disappear. If, if you're there sitting with holding mom's hand, it appears to disappear. That's when mom seems to die. She hasn't died yet. The silver cord is still attached, but she's about to actually die. This, the moment when the silver cord detaches is the moment of actual bodily death. What happens is that mist rises and forms into a body above the material body, and that's that's the moment of death because the silver cord then detaches, and and everyone then is feeling for the pulse of the material body, and then everyone is sort of alarmed because there is no pulse. That's a moment of danger for the person who has died, because if if you then get alarmed at the fact that everyone's saying, "Oh no, there's no pulse," you might then focus on the people around the bed. What happens if you do? Then you lower your own, if you are the person who has died, you lower your own vibration. And when you do that, you may no longer be able to perceive the people who have come for you. That's how we make ghosts. Mm. Because if you can't see the people who have come for you, then you can't follow them, can you? And <laughs> suddenly you're, you're, you're isolated because your mom and or whoever the people are around your bed can't see you. You can't get their attention. You can't follow the people who have come for you and you can be stuck there for hundreds of years. So if, if I were going to give any advice to the people listening today, it's this, once you are out of your body, 
it's irrevocable. You can't get the attention of the people around the bed. The only thing you can do is follow your deathbed visitors. So follow them. They're going to take you home. And once you are home, you can help the people around the bed, but you can't do anything for them now. So having heard what I'm just saying to you, you'll do that. You'll follow your mom, your childhood pets, whoever has come for you, you'll follow them. And what happens is they'll be hugging you. They'll be saying, come with us, and you will happily do that. Now, you won't be going far because dying is very much like changing channels on a TV set. In the room around you now are hundreds of channels. And if you had a TV, you could tune them to channel two, channel three, channel four, channel five. Right now, you, your mind is tuned to your body on what you might call channel three, a very low channel, which is this material reality. When you die, all that happens is that your mind tunes to a slightly higher channel in the same place. There it will pick up a whole new reality in the same place. And the, and the people who have come for you, your mom, your childhood pets, your spirit guide, they will guide you in raising your vibration just enough to pick up that new channel, which is the Actually, it, it, you might call it the afterlife, but really it's just, it's just the astral plane in the same place where you are now. Which is what, where near-death experiencers go. That's, where they're, that's also where near-death experiencers go. Got it. And, and how about out of, same thing, out-of-body experiencers, like people who... Absolutely, same place. Okay. The afterlife is a very small part of the astral plane. In fact, near-death experiencers who are on an extensive near-death experience trip, will often come to a place and be told, you cannot go any farther. Mm -hmm. If you do, you will enter the place where the dead are. And your silver cord will sever, and you will have died. You will not be able to go back. It's really, because it, 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 when you keep saying silver cord, and I've heard that concept, by the way, the silver cord, the this long you know, cord that connects us, I Very remember cord. It, could go, it goes to the end of the universe and, and back. back, but what, it, it does, it does. And the thing is, I just, when I remember when you keep saying it, I just remember the cartoon, the Disney cartoon of Hercules. And when the souls were being sent down to Hades, it was this cord that needed to be cut in order for them to be able to go. And I just remember that even, even Disney's animators figured that out, I guess it was part of, the, the mythology of, of Greek mythology, that there was a cord that needed to be cut. So it's, that's a concept that's been around for quite some time. It's in the Bible. It goes back thousands of years. It's, it's fascinating. Okay, so now that, all right, so the soul is passed into the astral plane, which is something that, you know, we've heard a lot about through near-death experiencers and that whole, that whole process, the life review. What, so from your research, where do we go from here? Well, what, what, what happens is they take you to directly to the afterlife. So, so what happens, as, as your, your vibration and theirs rise together, the, the room that you leave, the room where, you're, where your dead body is and your family is, and they're going, oh, no, he just died. And you're thinking, ah, ha, ha, you don't know, I haven't died after all. The, that room becomes vague and vapory. And what opens before you, or there's a mist that you've sort of gone through, and what opens before you is this beautiful scene, all these colors that don't exist in life, you know, in, in this world. Every, it's just the most beautiful thing you can imagine. And it's the afterlife, because you enter directly into the part of the astral plane, which is the afterlife. And there you are. And, and your, your other relatives welcome you. Everybody is just, it's just the best you can imagine. But it's right in the same place. It's just at a higher vibratory rate, not even that much higher. And it's what we call level three. It's the lowest of what, what, are the, what the Vikings called the Summerland levels, three, four, and five of the afterlife. So, but so the, these levels that you're talking about, we're still in the astral plane, or we just passed the astral plane? The astral plane is farther away. This okay. is, the, it, think of it as a foyer. 
Okay, I, I got you. But in the where are we where are these life reviews, these uh, councils of well, elders, all that stuff? Yes, the, the the true life review happens in the afterlife. There's a simulacrum of the of the life review that can happen in the in the um, in the larger astral plane if you are having a near death experience. Let me ask you this because you keep saying vibrations and and different levels of awareness. I have to ask you these these yogic masters, these um, you know ascended masters who eventually become ascended masters, but were masters down here. The Jesus is the the Buddhas. The, these these uh, masters who meditate heavily and have they speak of the, the astral planes. Are they able to kind of dab in and dab out because of their meditative abilities to be able to transcend this thing from your research? I'm not sure I understand your question. You, you, they, they can vibrate much yes, higher. That's what I'm talking about. Yes. Their yes, vibrations are higher. Yes. It's easy to go lower than your vibratory rate. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So, that, <laughs> so, so you, if, if you're vibrating very, very high, you can easily go lower. You just can't go any higher than your vibratory rate. But you can raise, but you can raise your vibratory rate as you're alive. You gradually can raise whatever your ceiling is. Right, which and is if what your ceiling is very, very, very high. Mm -hmm. You can easily go lower. Right, but do, are they? Because I've I've read, you know, through my my research in yogic texts and things like that, that some of these yogis have been able to go into the astral plane at will and 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 come back in their meditations. Is that something that you found in your research as yes, well? Yes. Yes, yes. And and most of us can easily hold to level three. Because mm -hmm. most of us enter the afterlife at level three, and we have no trouble holding that level. Got it. Okay. That's, a, that's the standard thing we can do. But, you know, you and I will be able to do it without a problem. Getting above level three is something most people have more trouble doing. So explain, what are the next levels? Level four and, and level five are also parts of the standard Summerland level. We, all, all of us will try very hard to get to level four and level five. Once we are, and, and to do that, we will, we will reincarnate repeatedly on the earth. The trouble is there is amnesia when we come back. Mm -hmm. We don't remember why we did, you wonder why babies cry? Babies forget. People, we forget when we enter a baby's body again. And, and we, yes, we have to, I think, I think of it as shrinking ourselves in, to get back into a body. And then we've, and we've totally forgotten why we did that. And then we, we get born, and it's such an awful experience that, that we, we, we cry. Um, and we do this repeatedly to experience the negativity that we cannot experience in the afterlife or in the astral plane. They are not negative at all. But there's a lot of negativity here. I don't need to explain that to people. We are all here. But we don't understand just how bad this is until we go back to the afterlife or to the astral in a, in a near-death experience or, or, or by astral traveling. And we see how great it is there. And, and you know, what, do I, what can I tell you? Um, but we come here to experience that negativity. Gradually, by coming back here repeatedly, we gradually raise our vibratory rate to level four and finally to level five. Once we get toward the upper level, a part of level five, we cease to need to incarnate. These are the ascended masters, the Jesus is the Buddhas of the world. Yeah, well, yes, Jesus is way above that at this point. At this point, yes. But at one yes. point, he was at a level five. We all have to walk before we run. <laughs> we all walk before we run. Yes. yes. Yeah. But, gotcha. but um, and, and and eventually they get to level six, um, and when they get to level six, that's called the teaching level, um, or or the 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 um, causal level. That's where most of what exists in the afterlife and in the astral plane have been have been created. Um, that's where the that's where the teachers are. Um, most of most of the Buddhas. Uh, and the and the, um, the the ascended masters are on level six. 
they, they aspire to level seven. Level seven is the Godhead level. That's not where God is, but that's where the source is, the source of much of what is on earth. Now, what we used to think was that that was where God is, but God is even higher than that. Um, we're trying to understand now, we who do this research, what is above the Godhead level, but there's more above the Godhead level, even more. Um, uh, there apparently is no, is no height. We, we're, we're coming to understand that consciousness, which is all that exists, is more like a cup without, without a top. Um, we, we don't it just, know. It can keep growing and growing and growing. We, we can grow forever. We, we, it, we don't know what the top is. It's so fascinating. And, 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 you know, the work that I do here with the show, and I speak to people like you, I'm always fascinated at how much overlap there is between different philosophies, different spiritual texts. I mean, the things you're talking about are, you know, you were saying Viking, uh, Viking uh, lore, as well as, you know, Hindu, Jainism, um, you know, yogic philosophies, all of this stuff is overlapping. Many of the things you're talking about, I'm not surprised by any of this. There's uh, one truth, my dear. There's one Right, truth. that's the thing. We and all that's approach a, it from different ways. Exactly. It's all one truth. And that's the thing that's so fascinating about it is because as more I, as I study this more and more, I come to keep realizing that there is one truth. Truth is truth, regardless of where you get it from. Yes. You know, whether it's a channel, it's a medium, it's a text, it's a book, it's a, a guru. If the truth is truth, it rings at a certain vibration. And, you know, you, when you read Autobiography of a Yogi by Yogananda, the truth rings in that book, uh, as many other books that I've read over the course of of my life so far. So everything you have heard of this, the, there's I've heard there's seven levels and each of those seven levels are broken up into seven other levels. So there's 49 levels. Yeah, yeah, many. Yeah. But there's many, there, there are hundreds of, of sub levels. Correct. Um, there's, we, we, there, we, we talk about the seven levels, but there's hundreds of sub levels. There are probably an infinite number of sub levels. Right. So it's all right. So, and so people listening, a lot of the, the, the ascended masters, the these uh, these beings, you know, Saint Germain and and you know Jesus and and these kind of people, they they've been to this earth so many times that they finally got to a place where they don't need to come back anymore, and they choose to come uh, to help and guide they humanity. They're that's they're right. at the teaching that's, level. That's what they want to do. Now now we talked about Christianity, which which is entirely human made. The most famous most known name most known known person on the earth is jesus mm -hmm. but people know jesus for things which are totally untrue about jesus and yet his teachings are true except nobody knows what his teachings are and we have been asked now by jesus to give him a website how jesus knows about websites i have no idea i mean what i mean but we're but we're going to give him the website he has asked for. It's going to be called teachingsbyjesus.com. How he knows about that stuff, I don't know. But it'll be up next year. That's fascinating. And it's it's uh, I think I, I love one of my favorite quotes is by Yogananda who said, Jesus was crucified for one day, but his teachings were crucified for the last 2,000 years. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. And he has decided it's time for people to know what he actually said. Because it's been, yeah, exactly. And then the same, I mean, and you could say that with all, any religion that starts with a figurehead, it has been twisted and turned a little bit here and there. It just, the nature of man. He has had a holy, holy patience. I don't know why he was so patient. I would have to agree with you on that. <laughs> I would have to agree. Well, I think it's also that it's really interesting too, because we are at a stage now in our evolution as a species and as, as, as a you know, group of souls on the planet that we're more awakened now, I think, than we have in within the last four or 5,000 years. We're I think we're more willing and able to start listening and hearing these messages. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully we are. But I mean, look, this conversation in the 70s would have been a lot odder. 
And it's still odd in certain in certain conver- <laughs> in certain corners of the world without question. But it is a much more accepted and more people are looking for it. More people are searching for the truth. That's why um, I, I was speaking to uh, I was speaking to another guest the other day. They're saying, you know, people are leaving religions by the buttload because they just don't they're not connecting anymore. They're they like, no, there has to be more to this. I I, I need to I want to I don't need the middleman. I need to find my direct connection to a source. And these truths who have been around for thousands of years are starting to bubble up with shows like myself, with the work that you're doing and things like that. Would you, would you agree? Oh, of course. Oh, big time. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Now, one thing that a lot of people uh, ask me all the time is do we plan our lives? Yes. And I'll, so, so please elaborate on how we plan and why we plan, because people, you know, people listening a lot of times they ask in the comments and things like that. They're like, why would you want to get cancer? Why would you want to have an abusive parent? Why would you want to go through pain in this life? And then why do some people obviously, you know, get born with, a def- you know, some sort of physical deformity and others are born into a billion dollar, you know, uh, it becomes a billion dollar heiress and never has to truly worry about those kind of things for the rest of, the, of this life. Why it seems so unfair. Some people can't even get water right now as we speak, and other people have five thousand houses and six private jets, and they it's three people. You know, it's like two, you know, two people. Like, how many more houses do you need? How many more, you know, th- stuff do you need? So there seems to be an unbalance, and I, and I love to hear what you think about that. In regards the to the hardest, planning of life, the hardest lessons are uh, really the hardest single hardest lesson you could have would be wealth. People, people um, are there. People in our real lives um, are afraid to plan wealth because it it's the most it's the hardest, most dangerous lesson you could have, and it's too easy to set yourself back by eons spiritually if you give yourself wealth as a lesson. And um, so people, people shy away from it. People don't want to have that lesson. Um, people plan um, hard lives because that you, you get the most value out of those hard lives. And so people eagerly plan to have uh, very, very hard lives. They plan diseases, they plan poverty, they plan a lot of people um, in, the, in the United States uh, plan who, who, for example, were slaveholders, planned to be um, uh, uh, poor black people in uh, during Jim Crow because they needed to have that balance, and and uh, and mm. you know get get rid of the 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 negative ne- negativity in their uh, their their karma, if you will, from uh, having been slaveholders in in the the American South. Um, that, that's the kind of thing. I mean, that when, when you're there, you know, in our real lives, all you want to do is grow spiritually and you need to get rid of whatever negativity came out of a life you may have lived here uh, in which you were wealthy and you, and you gave yourself negative karma. So uh, we, 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 see our, we see these lives on earth very differently than we, than we think we we're going to see them. Um, we, we see the lives on earth as very short. Um, we, we see uh, the things that look good to us here as very negative there because they can set us back spiritually and we don't want that. You know, to be, to be a rich person here uh, is, is and, and not to have done valuable things for the world, for, for, for people in the world with our money, to have, have had that jet, and not uh, used it f- f- in a way which was valuable for people, that's not going to help us spiritually, is it? And spiritual wealth is the only thing that matters. That's part of the teachings of Jesus that we're going to help expose the people to the world. We, 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 long since, people should have known what Jesus taught, but nobody can recite what Jesus taught. People, those gospel teachings have been in the Bible for 2,000 years, and people don't know what they say. 
Mm. That's a pity and a shame because we're only going to be teaching the canonical gospels. We're not even going to teach the other gospels. There's no need. It's pretty fascinating. You know, it seems like it's almost like, you know, I need to lose a little weight or I need to put a little bit more muscle on. So I'm going to work out this muscle and this way. Yeah, it's, it's, exactly. you know, and I got to do a little bit more cardio because I got to get rid of the, you know, the muffin top. So I got to do this kind of stuff and I have to eat properly. It's the same, it's almost, it's a workout. So it's a spiritual workout with this body. And when we're in the body, we're just like, this is horrible because we're not aware of what we're doing, <laughs> but our spirit is like, no, we got to go through this because we picked up a, a bunch of calories in three lives ago that we were really yes. bad. And we picked up a bunch of calories. We got to burn yes. off. Especially now when they're, when they're, they're aborting so many babies um, with the lives on earth are precious. We, people need to come into the, these, this is the only place we can grow spiritually the way we need to grow spiritually. These bodies are precious and people want to get into these bodies and have these tough, tough lives because we can grow. I, I don't care who you are. If you are under the age of 70 and in reasonable health, I can help you make this your last earth lifetime. Mm. How your is that? last earth lifetime. How do you do that? Follow the teachings of Jesus strictly, and it's your last earth lifetime, guaranteed. I've heard, I've heard everything you're saying. I've heard in multiple places. Everything you're saying it is so true. It's just the, the having to work things out, having to get things. And another thing that a lot of people are confused about is why they're here, because of course we all forget why we're here. And it's I, fine. I can help you know. See, that's the thing. It's not that hard. So that's my question. How can we find out what our mission or our purpose is in this life? It's to learn to love completely, forgive completely. And once you have done those things, there's nothing more to be done. You are at the top of level five and that's it. So, but if you come, but if you're, you know, your mission here is to be uh, an architect because you're going to discover a new way of building buildings that's going to help save the planet. And you're just like, nah, you know, really, I want to play music. Um, does any of that matter. kind of. Those things don't matter. Hmm. So if someone's feeling lost in their life, you're saying to do what? All you have to do, it, it, it's, it's three things, really. But, but, it, but they all boil down to one, forgiving and loving. Okay. That sounds like two, but, but, but the, forgiving, <laughs> the forgiving is a necessary prelude to the loving. Okay, fair and enough. And gratitude is what, it, it, gratitude plows the earth. Forgiving sows the seed. And love is the harvest. It's that, it's that simple. So with, with all the research that you've done over the course of your life, um, it seems like you've, you've gone at it from every angle, every culture throughout history, and you've kind of put it all, combined it all together to figure out where the common truths are. Is that a fair statement? I, 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 is it, no, it really is. It wasn't that hard. First, okay. first, I had to understand what happens at and after death. And that wasn't that hard. Once I got what they had been, what they were telling us a hundred and some odd years ago, once I really got that and I knew what happened, what happens. I, and by, by the way, why isn't it common knowledge now? If it was so easy for me to find it simple science, shut it down in the 1915, 15, 1920 range. They absolutely shut it down because, um, what, once Max Planck, who was the, got the 1918 Nobel Prize as the founder of quantum mechanics, once he said consciousness basically underlies it all, they said, we ain't, we ain't going there. The, the scientific gatekeepers, the... Uh, the, the, the establishment. The yeah, the establishment said, we're, no, we're not going to go. We, we won't go, go there. We, we, that's it. And to this day, they enforce materialism as the fundamental... Right. The fundamental scientific, um, uh, if, if, you, if, if you try to, in, to investigate anything that has to do with death and the afterlife, they will not allow you to be a practicing scientist 
certainly in the United States, and I think it's probably still true in the world. This is the greatest shame in the scientific community to this day. But one, but one thing that is happening, and I've been seeing and reading scientific papers in regards to it, is that quantum physics and quantum mechanics is they're they're starting to prove certain things. They're starting to come back to, they're starting to prove things that had been talked about in spiritual texts for six thousand years, uh, where Maya is now simulation theory, and simulation theory has just been proven by some scientists in. Uh, in in Japan, that there is a possibility, mathematically, that this is all a simulation, which is Maya, the illusion, which has been talked about for years. Yes, but you know that they're currently spending a billion with a B dollars <laughs> yes. that could be used to feed the poor to yep. try to find a source of consciousness inside the human brain. Mm-hmm. I know. I know. I understand what you you're saying. You know that that money could be used to feed the poor. And in fact, consciousness is the base creative force that underlies everything. I understand. Have you any idea what a folly that is? It is unfortunate. And it is unfortunately the process of, of humanity. We keep bumping our heads against the wall. <laughs> I've been against the cave since the beginning of time. This is all because they're terrified of finding God. Yes, Max Planck found God, and he found God almost 100 years ago. Right. And there hasn't been any hugely major advances in quantum mechanics since then. because Or in any, or in any other basic science. Think about this. Physics has been dead for almost 100 years. Really? You're absolutely right. Great theory. You know, nothing. Yeah, a couple things here and there, but nothing of any major. No E you equals MC prove, squared. It's all theories. They can't prove any of it because it's all dead ends. It's fascinating. Um, one thing that I I heard you say in an interview is the worst ways to die. Can you talk about that concept and what and what you found in your research? What is the worst way to die? Well, I don't know. I mean, let's talk about something positive. <laughs> no, I remember you said something in an interview re- or, or in a conversation about um, the U.S. hospitals or something like. If you die in a U.S. hospital, it's like the worst way <laughs> to die, other than like being. Hanged and quartered was even higher on the list of better ways to die. I don't, Lord, I'm talking about something positive right now. <laughs> okay, fine. I mean, we'll I stop mean, it. We'll stop. We'll go that, back. That the worst kind of, the worst, let's talk about the worst kind of career. The worst kind of career right now is to be a scientist. Because if you're a scientist, you have to spend your, in order to put your kids through college, even to feed them, you've got to live a lie. Let's talk yeah. about that. That's very true. That's very true. And they ha- it, the same thing happens in the medical field. You know, doctors, if you vary at all through what they believe is the way to go, you can't practice medicine. And so many MDs are going out and doing, they're like, no, there's other ways. You can heal the body in other ways. Yes, that it's yes. natural. I'm That's- married to a doctor. Tell me about it. You know, like it's very frustrating. I know doctors... I have, I've gone to MDs who've become alternative doctors, but have an MD because they were like, I'm so frustrated. I can't help my, my I can't yes. help without prescribing a pill, you know, and yeah. there's play, there's a place and time for that, but not every single time. Yeah. <laughs> and scientists is the same thing. They're forced to go down because it's an establishment, but hopefully in the near future, things will change. Um, I'm hoping, I'm hoping things will change in the future. The um, only thing that is going to, the only thing that at this point that ends it is shame. And the only thing that will shame them will be some kind of direct telephone communication with people that that are known to be dead. Um, We've, we've talked about that. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and um, there, they actually, people who that we used to think were dead are actively working on telephone communication. And, And the trouble is that there are negative entities who feed on fear who uh, are are trying very hard to prevent it from happening because uh, once there's no more fear of death, uh, that you know their lives are over. There's no there's no way they can create fear any longer, and they need the fear to survive. And we know that those entities exist. Let me ask you a question: If we now, as a society, as a species, had no fear of death, would that hurt our development? As no. souls here? I'm just asking. 
No, I think I think it would be fine. I I I, I, I understand why you would wonder about that because right. this is a very useful place for us to have the fear to push against. But I think that there would be still enough uncertainty, and it's really the uncertainty that is enough. Uh, there would still be enough gray that that, and that's really all we need is the gray. Um, I, we, all, all we need is to raise it because that, 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 that calibration is being watched very carefully by people far above my pay grade to make sure that we don't raise, raise the, the positivity of this planet too much. We need to raise it some, but they are trying to make sure they don't raise it too much. But if, it's a very good point. That's a very thoughtful point that you make. Yeah. We, we can't, we, we, uh, Jesus talked about um, bringing the kingdom of God on earth. And we can't do that to the point where there's no fear, because that would be bad too. Because then the school doesn't work as well. Yes, exactly. Very thoughtful point you make. Yeah, it's, it's this is a school, and if, if you know you got if you've got the answers <laughs> before the test, it's not as yeah. really you'll pass, but not really. <laughs> but, but see, the way consciousness works is that when if if ten percent or so of the people on Earth raise their consciousness vibrations by quite a bit, it will raise all of our consciousness vibrations materially. And all of us will grow spiritually. We don't all have to do it. Just a, just a significant percentage of us need to, because all our consciousnesses are directly connected. It's all really one consciousness. In a very real sense, there's only one of us here. Um, we're all connected directly. One, one question I want to ask you in regards of your research on the, other, on the afterlife, what is your understanding of time? Um, there versus here. I mean, I my theory is obviously is not a theory. Time is a man-made element because it's a revolutions around our sun. And if we didn't have our sun, there would be no time as we know there actually it. Actually, is no time at all. Exactly. It's it's a man-made. It's a man-made. Uh, you know, thing. So, what is your understanding of time there? How how is it even calibrated? Is it calibrated? It isn't. There is no time there at all. It doesn't. It doesn't go in either direction. It goes. There is no time. That's what. Um, so that's what I've heard from other near deathers that they say is like a, a blink here, a blink there is a lifetime here because there's no real reference point. There's not like there, there's. It's not like you know our relatives are sitting like Jesus another twenty years before this guy gets here. Like it's not that way. No. It. It. it there is no. There is no sense of time passing there is no time okay now i'm going to ask you a few questions ask all of my guests uh what is your definition of living a good life a life lived for others is a life worthwhile and how do you define god god is all that exists god is everything i um i i don't think of god as an entity, I think of God as everything. Um, I think of God as all that exists. And where can people find out more about you and the work that you're doing? My website is robertagrimes.com, just my name.com with no punctuation. And uh, seekreality.com is our new website where people can learn all that there is to know about Death in the Afterlife, and teachingsbyjesus.com will be up by early March. And that's the website Jesus asked me personally to do for him. It's his website. And I'm still trying to figure out why. I'm still trying to figure out why me and my what my spirit guide says, why not me? So I figure, okay, <laughs> I'll do it. Um and, and and since you just said spirit guide, I'd love to hear your perspective on who are spirit guides. Are they relatives? Are they entities that have, that have incarnated? Are they entities that have never incarnated? Are you know what is your definition of them? Are we all of us have you you? It's part of our package that we come to Earth with. In my particular case, my spirit guide and I met um, 
when we both were massacred uh, shortly after Jesus died. We were some of the very earliest Christians. And he has he goes back with Jesus a long time, long mm-hmm. before Jesus was even Jesus. I just go back 2,000 years with Jesus and with him. How did you, and, and how did you, how do you speak to him? How do you communicate oh, with your spirit guide? He's internal. Um, I, the first thing, if you want to know your spirit guide, the first thing you should do is to ask your spirit guide what he wants to be called. He'll say, you give me a name. And um, so I call him Thomas and he, and just say, please step outside of my body. So they will typically step outside on your dominant side. So he's just behind my left shoulder. And we, we communicate all the time, constantly. And do you have any parting messages for the audience? Yes. Um, you are a powerful, eternal being. You never begin. You never will end. And you cannot imagine how perfectly you are loved. Also, I, I guess I should say um, Seek Reality with Roberta Grimes is available on webtalkradio.net, and it's almost 10 years old. I podcast too, except unlike you, I have a great face for radio, so I only do it uh, <laughs> as audio, not as video. Roberta, thank you again so much for coming on the show, and thank you for all the work you've been doing all these years and uh, trying to get the word out on uh, and try to le- lessen the fear of the after death, uh, afterlife. Nothing to be feared. It's all joy. I appreciate you, my dear. Thanks again. Thank you.